Hello, everyone. So good to see you. Glad to be a part of your Bible study this week. I was a little bit surprised as I was looking back that the last time I was with you, we were at the near the beginning of 2 Corinthians. I think I was 2 Corinthians too. So as always, I'm happy to be with you today and also thankful for each and every one of you who's still here. We started many, many months ago in the book of Hosea. Now we've spent a little bit of time with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, and I want to thank each and every one of you who stuck with it this year. That's a good thing to create that kind of dedication and that kind of habit. So let's jump in. I wanted to mention just a couple things as I was looking back at the presentation I gave on 2 Corinthians 2, just to, I don't know, just to call back a couple of things that were on my mind, and uh, one of them kind of leads into today a little bit. This is just a general thing that I think about the book of 2 Corinthians. I've noticed that some of the passages that I kind of have memorized, one of them is coming up in a chapter or so, are from 2 Corinthians. But even though there's maybe a handful of chunks of scripture that I have memorized from 2 Corinthians, there's also enormous parts that I'm really not all that familiar with. And I have to confess that 2 Corinthians 10 as we jump in today, is a part that I was really not very familiar with. Sorry, I'm clicking the wrong way. This is one of the things I mentioned a couple months back, whenever it was that I was with you, is that sometimes when we read the Bible or hear God's word, and however we're hearing it, we do that to be reassured in other times. We study the Bible to be challenged, and I think that a lot of 2 Corinthians includes challenges, but this, uh, this reading especially is oriented towards being challenged. Something I want to mention also as we start going is this. When I first looked at this reading, I read it over and I thought, meh, seemed all right to me, seemed remotely interesting. I guess I'm trying to say kind of nice things about it because it's in the Bible. And though I don't especially think I'm going to be struck by lightning for saying something bad about it, I'm trying to be as nice as I can. Here's the truth. If this was one of three texts that I was about to preach on for a coming weekend, I probably would have glanced over at one time and moved on. I would have thought, ooh, hope the gospel reading is going to be good this coming weekend or hope the Old Testament reading is going to be good this coming weekend. Because at first glance, it just did not strike me as interesting. The reason I mention that is not to say there's something wrong with 2 Corinthians 10, but the reason I mention it is because this week for me is a good example of why it's often important to slow down and think and pray and study a little bit. Because the more and more I looked at 2 Corinthians 10, the more I found in it that was interesting. And today, as I was getting the slideshow ready, I thought, oof, I'm going to have too much to say instead of too little to say. Hopefully, that's hopefully neither one of those is the case. Hopefully, I'm somewhere comfortably in the middle of not too much and not too little. But I really did find things that I thought were very interesting. Dropped a few bullet points down here for you just to kind of see the primary themes I'm going to try to pick up on from our reading. First one, as you see there, is a Christ like and Christ centered ministry. I think that's where Paul begins this section. And um, really, it's kind of what carries through the whole thing. But I think that's interesting to look at and to think about how, how that would affect the way that you and I think about the ministry of the church in the 21st century. I also want to talk about integrating the faith into all of life, not having it just be a little slice of the grand pie that is me and you, filled with other things like interests and work and hobbies and relationships, having it just kind of be, you know, 10% of our life, but instead having the faith be something that's integrated into all of our life. And finally, I want to talk about the church as a launching point for mission work. That's kind of where the reading ends today. So I want to take a look at those three things. Something that is obvious, kind of the overarching theme of this section is that Paul is defending his ministry. In fact, if I remember correctly, I think that's even the bold print chapter heading inside my Bible. Paul defends his ministry. And that's right. And he has to do that a lot. 
and he especially is doing that to the church in Corinth. I'm not exactly sure why Corinth and Paul were a little bit like oil and water, but they are. They just kind of don't seem to be seeing eye to eye. The problems that they have are things that are really bothering Paul. You've probably heard us say this before, but people often talk about 1 Corinthians as being kind of a careful, thoughtful, theological letter. And then when 2 Corinthians gets sent, it's kind of like Paul reading them the riot act. They just haven't seemed to listen to what he said. And so he's coming with thunder. One of the things that I really have noticed about 2 Corinthians in my life is that is a deeply, deeply personal letter. Now, all of Paul's letters are personal. They even include things like personal openings. I, Paul, an apostle of the Lord, and Timothy, my brother, write to you. Sometimes Paul takes time to greet people who are in the city that he's writing to. So it's always personal. But what I mean is that 2 Corinthians is even a step beyond that, is even more personal. And that makes some sense because Paul's personal ministry in that place is under attack, but it feels extremely personal to me. It feels to me like Paul at his rawest. Now, do I know that? Of course I do not. That's just my educated guess as someone who's read everything that Paul has had to write, has studied Paul for a chunk of my life, and you know, feel like I have a sense of how Paul thinks and how Paul addresses certain situations. And when I read him in 2 Corinthians, is one of the most deeply personal, raw, emotional things that he's written. All right, so here we go. Overarching theme, but also where I want to begin in the opening couple verses of 2 Corinthians 10. The overarching theme, as you've heard me say, is Paul's ministry. He's already talked about this throughout the book. I remember in chapter two, when we were looking at that, he's trying to teach them how to bring back someone that he was in disagreement with. Well, the reason why this section interests me a lot is because of the example that Paul references when he's talking about his ministry style. He says, he starts with Jesus. Now, Maybe you're thinking to yourself, yeah, no kidding. That's where things are supposed to start. That's how we should think of the ministry, Jesus. Um, but it's not, it's not really that obvious. The complaint that we hear inside this section, or one of the complaints we hear inside this section, is that Paul did not impress them personally. They were, you know, whatever. They, they think that his writing style is really amazing. But when he's there, he just doesn't get the job done quite as well. I don't know. I, I've I've heard uh, I've heard speakers in my life where I kind of felt that way. They wrote a book that I really really enjoyed, and then when I saw them speaking at a conference, I thought, how can this be the same person? That book was so invigorating and full of life, and then you watch him talk, and you're like, hey, a little bit bored. That's sort of how Paul's come off to them. They think his writing is insightful and incisive, but they think his style when he was there isn't something that they it just didn't live up to the reputation. Here's my version of their question. I am clearly not quoting the Bible verbatim here, but in their minds, Paul comes off as lacking some kind of passion. He's just not as fierce in person as he is in writing. So they say things like this, how can his writing be so good, but when he's here, he's so milk toast. If you're not familiar with milk toast, it means something like bland. So this section, 2 Corinthians 10 begins like this. Paul reminds them that Jesus himself was meek and humble. I want to be crystal clear about that. Jesus is not always meek and humble. You might recall 
not long ago, it feels like in worship, we read about Jesus arriving and overturning the money changers tables in the temple. And maybe you remember him making a whip of cords, chasing people out. Definitely not always meek and humble. When Jesus begins his teaching ministry, the reaction about him in the synagogue is, wow, this guy teaches as one who has authority. So he's not always meek and humble. But something that is undoubtedly true is that Jesus is more meek and more humble than people would have expected the Son of God, the Messiah, to be. You know, so like if you were to sort of stop the world after the Old Testament and say to someone, all right, we've been thinking about this, looking forward to this for years and years. God's going to send a Savior. I'm going to give you some clues. God is going to send his own son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, to arrive on earth. How do you think it's going to go? Now, the reality is maybe there'd be a hundred different answers, but they'd all probably have in common power and glory and strength. This is almost the same kind of thing that John the Baptist finds himself even a little bit confused by when he's in prison near the end of his life, even though his entire life and ministry has been dedicated to setting the groundwork for Jesus' ministry. When he's in prison, knowing he's going to die, he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the one or should we wait for another? See, Jesus was so meek and humble in comparison to expectations that it even surprises John the Baptist. This reading for today, Paul bumping into expectations of what his ministry should be like, it reminded me of something I had read years and years ago. So I spent a few minutes this morning tracking it down. Thankfully, it was on page one of the book. So it was very, very easy. But I was reading this author. Her name is Alice McKenzie. Alice McKenzie is one of the leading scholars on biblical wisdom right now. And um, she was writing about what we tend to expect of ministers. So I'm kind of jumping off here. Paul did not live up to Corinth's expectations of what he would be like when he arrived. Sort of jumping off to think, okay, well, maybe sometimes we have the wrong expectations. What are our expectations. Alice McKenzie is writing about that, and she wrote this. For the past several decades in the United States, social trends have shaped the advice pastors have received concerning who they should be. So you hear her. She's saying simply that trends in the world have shaped how seminarians think about what kind of pastors they ought to become or pastors, how, what they should do, what they should be like. Here's her read on it. And I agree with much of this. The 1960s told us to be prophets. She doesn't mean a future seeing prophet. She means a holding, um, holding power to account the way the prophets in the Old Testament did to be the moral compass of the world. The 1970s told us to be therapists, she said, and that's right. The rise of the therapeutic mindset, seeing ministers as um, counselors and therapists. Very likely, if you were to ask yourself this simple question, you'll kind of land on some of these or one of these. If someone were to say, Mark is very pastoral, what image would come to your mind? I think for a lot of people, it's that one. It's the 1970s counselor version. That's what they tend to mean. Doesn't mean that I'm a Greek scholar or um, a great preacher, typically in our minds, pastoral means something like that. Counselor oriented. It goes on. The 1980s told us to be church growth consultants, pop psychology, manipulation, marketing, all that kind of stuff. The 1990s told us to be CEOs and player coaches. And that's really right. That's the kind of stuff that, not that I was taught in seminary. In seminary, we were taught to not care about most, most of this stuff and care about things like people in the Bible. But I went to a great seminary. Maybe not every pastor in the world gets that kind of education. There's a lot of truth to this. 1990s, pastors as CEOs. 
Now, it doesn't really matter to me if you agree with Alice McKenzie's four categories, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and what we expected ministers to be, but it does strike me as absolutely true, whether you agree with those four or not, that it is absolutely positively true that we too often permit our cultural values to shape our church values. And by that, I don't, this is a tough this is a tough point to make, I think. What I don't mean is, you know, the issues that our culture is oriented towards, that we naturally orient, to, orient towards those as well. I don't mean that. I think what I mean is the characteristics that our culture tends to value. So in Corinth, characteristics like personal characteristics, what makes someone a leader what makes someone worthy of following, that kind of stuff. So in Corinth, they had an expectation that Paul was going to be an amazing speaker. I kind of suspect that Paul was a pretty doggone good speaker. I think he was probably pretty impressive. Not every one of his sermons went all that well. I think I remember in the book of Acts, somebody fell asleep and fell out a uh, second-story window because Paul's sermon went too long. So, you know, maybe he's not the greatest preacher ever, but I kind of find him compelling. When I hear about him talking in the book of Acts, he seems pretty interesting. The crowds often think so too. But in Corinth, they had seen and heard better. And because that was important to them, a person's ability to present in a winsome way, in a way that informed and moved them, because they expected that from Paul's writings when he arrives and doesn't live up to that standard, they think he's less than. They're just not that impressed. That also reminded me that Jesus mentioned one time the expectations that people had about him and John the Baptist. This is something that I've, I've always kind of found this verse fascinating. And this isn't so much like a, you know, first century Greco-Roman world cultural value. This is like a cultural value of the religious leaders, Jewish religious leaders. Jesus says this, talking about how he doesn't tend to line up with their expectations. He said, John the Baptist, he came, he didn't eat or drink. And they complained about him by saying he has a demon. The son of man, Jesus, me, he's talking about himself, came both eating and drinking. And they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So they had a cultural value for their religious leaders that they would be you know, I don't know, maybe the same kind of thing that we used to think, that they would be, uh, they have to be teetotalers or something like that, and Jesus wasn't. Jesus drinks with his disciples. He drinks with friends. He even shares company with the uh, dregs of society, people that the Pharisees would never have wanted to be seen with. Jesus spends time with them. He doesn't fit their cultural sense of what it would mean to be there. Here's a quote that I love. I was thinking about this today as I was thinking about that verse from Jesus, thinking about Paul, um, thinking about those, um, those categories that the author Alice McKenzie mentioned about what we expect from ministers. This is a quote that I heard often in my early years of ministry. I have no interest in trying to be a better Christian than Jesus was. I, of course, had the wonderful opportunity after my years in seminary to learn as a young pastor under Pastor Schwab. He's totally right. What he was getting at, of course, was that he felt like some people's expectations were that he floated above the ground when he prayed or walked. And for him, it was pretty simple to say, no, those expectations aren't just unnecessary. They're actually silly. And the reason they're silly is because Jesus himself wasn't even like that. I think that's right. So, all joking aside, there's something here for us, and this is really interesting to me. So here Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, talking about how their expectations of him were not met, and because he wasn't as vibrant a preacher as they expected him to be, too often it permitted them to not care that much about what he was saying. And what that made me think about for a few minutes was to take a step back and to say, 
okay, well, what are the things that we tend to value in people that we want to listen to? I don't just mean you and me. I mean, as a culture. And these are just a handful of things that I came up with. I'm sure this list could be 20 things long or 40 things long. But you know, I'm not trying to speak ill of others, but really often when I watch um, when I watch people preach, not that I do that very often, but when I'm you know either sort of popping through Facebook and seeing some message my friends put out at their church or just watching some famous preachers or something like that, it strikes me that they talk a lot the same way as infomercial speakers from like a generation ago. They try to have that very feverish uh, pitch, constant talking, constant hand movement, and they try to make sure that every fourth or fifth word has very strong emphasis on it. I remember years and years and years ago visiting a church, and again, I, I try to turn off my critical mind when I'm at someone else's church listening to someone else preach, but the dude we were listening to, it's like he had read a book that said he needed very strong emphasis on like every fifth word and the reason I started kind of chuckling to myself during the sermon is because he had followed this pattern so specifically that at one point in time, he emphasized the word, um, I just thought, man, what are you doing up there, dude? You read a book this week about how to emphasize syllables and words. Maybe you should have read the book of Matthew this week or something. So anyways, not trying to be, not trying to be too critical, but it's kind of the point of the text. The kinds of things that we tend to value culturally is passion, entertainment, maybe a desire to be practical or personal. And I don't really mean true practicality. I mean the facade of practicality, the facade of personalization. This message is exactly for you. The kinds of things we don't value as a culture are things like expertise. We prefer passion. If someone is really, really passionate about a subject, they actually sound more compelling to us than someone who's careful and rational and actually has expertise in the subject. That's not great. And even though those things are all fine things, they're all good. Passion's great. Entertainment's fine. Practicality, super wonderful. They just don't compare to the example that we have in Jesus that Paul references. Jesus, who is known in meekness and in humility. There's an old joke about um, when churches go to find new pastors, what they're looking for. And it's just some silly thing about um, 25 years experience, but um, in his late 20s so that he can you know, connect to the youth or something. Uh, impossible list of things for one person to do. But you know, so often, so often the point I guess I'm trying to make is that so often we follow those cultural values and we should always be mindful of things that are biblical values, things like humility. I don't know. To me, it's just interesting, an interesting thing to think about. It's the same kind of thing that Paul faced in Corinth that Jesus faced is the same kind of stuff that sometimes we bump into, that our cultural expectations, when the person speaking to us doesn't meet them, that it's too easy to push aside whatever it is that they're trying to say. Here's something I often tell my confirmation students. This is almost a verbatim quote. So for those of you who've had kids come through our confirmation program, likely you've heard me say this, but I don't expect that you memorize it because I didn't say it passionately enough with enough entertainment value. Just kidding. I often tell our confirmands that when they go out on their own one day and it's time for them to choose a church, I encourage them to not base that decision on whether they enjoy the music or the pastor. Doesn't matter if it all feels culturally relevant. Instead, I encourage them to ask themselves this simple question. When I'm in the house and listening, is the central message about God's gracious activity in Christ Jesus?
If it is, that might be a good church for you. If it isn't, doesn't matter how much you like other things about it. That's not the central thing we're looking for. So was Paul the most exciting person to listen to? I guess not. The Corinthians didn't feel that way. But was his message worth listening to? You betcha. You betcha. The person who's delivering it? Yeah. I try to work to be a better preacher and a better teacher, a better communicator all the time. It's a huge part of my life. I live it. I love it. At the same time, it is not the most important part. It's not the package. It's the goods that are being delivered. God's gracious activity in Christ Jesus. They just couldn't get over what they expected Paul to be like. They wanted him to be, you know, the absolute most wonderful orator of all time. And when he wasn't, they just couldn't get over it. I guess probably even more specifically, they had had someone else come in who was a better speaker. And even though that person was teaching or preaching falsehood, they didn't care if the message was false as long as the speaker was compelling. Paul's calling them to something different. I found that interesting. So thank you for assigning me 2 Corinthians 10, because I would not have thought about that today. I would not have read about it, would not have pondered it. Now I have, and I'm thankful for it. Another section I love about 2 Corinthians 10 is kind of came in, you know, the end of that first paragraph. Paul talks about taking every thought captive to obey Christ. I really like that. After I read this chapter two or three times, that was one of the things that was sort of jumping off the page at me. Those words were kind of pulsing at me. So I wanted to stop and take a look at it. I really like it. But full disclosure, I'm not totally sure what it means. And that's something I feel like I bump into sometimes in 2 Corinthians. You've studied it more this year than I have, so maybe you feel differently. But one of the things I've noticed about 2 Corinthians is, whereas Paul is usually waxing philosophical or theological, pretty rational thinker, careful, straightforward, seems prepared and ready. In 2 Corinthians, because it is a little bit more personal, or seems more personal and emotional, there does there do seem to be times where instead of being philosophical, he's more poetic. And that's kind of how I feel about this section. He's sort of jumping off into poetry here. And the reality is the poetry is just harder to understand. You might remember that from Hosea. The narrative sections, pretty easy to understand. Poetic sections, pretty difficult. And that's true in moments like this too with Paul. He's talking about a situation or addressing an issue. Pretty easy to understand what he's getting after. And you know, I don't, you and I don't know exactly what was going on in Corinth, but we get a pretty good feel. He's pretty easy to listen to and pretty easy to understand. And moments like this, very compelling, but more difficult to understand exactly what, what it means. But even though I don't know exactly what it means, here's stuff that I do believe about learning how to hold every cap, every thought captive to obey Christ. Number one is really, really hard. Very, very difficult. The reality is, whether you like to hear this or not, it's true. Might not feel good for you to hear it, but it is absolutely true, is that our fundamental disposition as broken human beings is selfishness. That's what we are at our core. Unbelievably selfish. You've heard me say this a hundred times over the years, you're getting bored of it, but Sometimes when people ask us why Lutherans baptize babies, you know, I could like make a biblical case. I could make a gospel case. The real answer is because babies are sinners. That's, the, that's probably the core of it. They need forgiveness because we're born selfish. We're selfish, you know, you can only be a few months old. You already show signs of selfishness. And we never tend to let that go not without constant help, not without working at it and working at it and working at it. So that's one of the things that we're being called to here. We're being called to abandon our natural disposition, which is that every thought of mine is held captive to me. And we're going to try to learn how instead to hold every thought captive in obedience to Jesus. That is really, really tough stuff. And yet, we're called to orient ourselves toward it. I think that we should try. 
what I'm taking from that, having every thought held captive to obey Christ, is that we ought to work always on integrating our faith into every aspect of our life. Now, what I don't mean is, this kind of goes back to point one, sometimes what you and I think of what it means to be a Christian, it's actually not Christianity, it's 1950s social decorum. Now, seems like it was a nice decade, I wasn't born yet, but it sounds like it was a nice time. At the same time, those are not the exact same as biblical values. I'm not saying these next things are good, but you know, we used to kind of grow up with uh, don't smoke, don't chew. Here, I made this more practical for you. And don't go with guys that do. What I'm talking about is learning how to have our entire lives be shaped by the gospel working on us. If on Sunday, once a week, we think that God forgives us is the grandest thing in the entire world, but then refuse to forgive someone on Monday, that's not a life that has the faith integrated throughout it. You probably remember the parable. The dude owes the king or the master, whoever it is, umpteen quadzillion dollars, asks for mercy and receives it, walks out, refuses to forgive someone who owes him a significantly lower sum. See, that's a life that has not had the faith integrated into it. He celebrated the mercy of the king, but then refused to have that mercy shape him, refused to show that mercy. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a faith that informs all of our life. That's what I'm hearing when I hear that every thought should be held captive in obedience to Jesus, that the faith is integrated in every aspect of our lives. Kind of repeating myself here, but if we think God's kindness toward us is great, but we refuse to show kindness to others, that's not great. That's not great at all. If on Sunday mornings we leave receiving the benediction of the Lord, being told to go in peace, but then we are hostile all the time. That's a weak witness. That's not a life that has the faith integrated through it. Now, again, remember what I said at the beginning. This is really hard. You and I cannot even possibly live this perfectly. And yet, part of the witness of the church is to do our best to live it as best we can. Here's something I believe is true. You're better off being a woefully inadequate Christian 24-7 than a perfect Christian for one hour a week and then live just like the world all the rest of the time. Now, I don't particularly believe this about you. Hope you don't believe it about me. But I'd rather be kind of a regular person who's pretty much same Sunday through Thursday. Not that I don't have good and bad, up and down, but... I try not to be a totally different person on Sunday morning when I'm standing up in front of you than I am on Tuesday. Yeah, sure, I don't wear jeans on Sunday. But I would rather be, uh, I'd rather have my faith integrated into my life all week than just be some character on Sunday morning or something like that. One of the reasons why it's important, it's not just because it's our witness to the world, it's also because God didn't only ask for one hour of our lives. God wants all of it. Every single hour of our lives belong to him, not just the one hour that we give for worship, not just the extra hour that we give for Bible study. One hour, two hours, God wants all the hours. He wants every one of your thoughts held captive in obedience to Jesus. After I wrote that, I all of a sudden paused and thought, you know, I want to make sure I'm being clear about this, what it would mean to have every thought captive to Jesus. I don't think it means that you should spend every minute of your day reading the Bible. I don't think it means that in order to be a good Christian, you have to stop every hour in the hour and say a five-minute prayer. If you want to do that, sure, that's fine. It's more like this. The goal is to have all of our hours be lived with a biblical view of life in the world. 
what we're trying to push against is something that is unbelievably common in 21st century U.S. America, and frankly, was true for decades before that too, just so that we don't be caught shouting at the darkness. Our cultural one is one that says you can live however you like with you at the center of the universe almost all the time, but as long as you dabble in Jesus stuff once in a while, you're going to be fine. That is simply not what the Bible calls us to, not even close. There's a, remember one of my friends was telling me that in the South, especially, there's kind of a typical saying in the, um, you know, in the, the Southern Baptist church that they'll say, oh, well, that's not a, that's not Sunday, Mark, that's Saturday, Mark. You know, just kind of the idea that the expectation was that you showed up on Sunday morning playing a role, a character, someone different, pretend to be a holy roller for one hour of the week. And you could act however you want other times. That's no knock against the South, no knock against Southern Baptists. That's just who I had heard it from. The reality is that that's true of a lot of Christians. Putting on airs for one hour a week, pretending to be righteous before God for one hour a week, and then being however you want to be before the world the rest of the time. God's not fooled. Neither is the world. Better to be, better to be inadequate all the time and own it. Be you because the best witness in the world is that we are always forgiven sinners. All right, the last thing I wanna mention, just took a peek at the clock and I think I'm going too long. You're welcome to pause this anytime you want, but I'm not starting over. So sorry about that. Last thing I wanna mention is in the closing section, I'm kind of jumping off the page a little bit here, but Paul is talking about, again, he's kind of talking about how, you know, they are kind of a, part of his area of influence. And he's hoping that, you know, as the gospel connects to them, that he'll be able to work even further. And one of the things that that did for me was it just made me think about how you and I as Christians ought to kind of model that same sort of behavior. That as you and I become stronger in the faith, that the gospel would spread both through our relationships, but also that we would support the gospel moving to other people. So this is sort of the life as a mission launching pad. Here's the encouragement. Each and every one of us, all of you sit in the room, you have different people that you influence in life. I remember one time I was at a church and the pastor, he did a really, really interesting thing. He said, okay, everybody, I want you to stand up right now if the person who brought you to faith was a friend. A handful of people stood up. Then he said, now I want you to stand up if the person who brought you to faith was a family member. The vast majority of people stood up. He sat him back down and he said, now I want you to stand up if the person who brought you to faith was a pastor. Nobody stood up. Now, that wasn't bad news for him. That was the point. The point he was making is that, in large part, the faith is spread through people. Not a Pentecost-style evangelist baptizing 3,000 people in the streets. Maybe one day, who knows what the future holds. But the reality is that the gospel primarily spreads through the lives of people. And as your life is impacted by the faith, as your life is impacted by Jesus, one of the things that we absolutely should do is every once in a while take stock, look around and say, hey, this is a life-changing thing for me. Who else is in my life that might need to hear this message? Who do I have a good enough relationship to that I could go up to them and just say, hey, you know what? I know you don't go anywhere on Sunday mornings. If you want to come to church with me, I'd be glad to buy you a brunch on the way home, something like that. It also reminds us that as we mature in the faith and as the church in Corinth hopefully one day would need less of Paul's particular attention, that they would see that they would be a launching pad for him to go elsewhere, that they would support that ministry, that they would give generously and support mission work around the world. I think that's kind of a cool idea. So I want to apologize if I went too long. 
I didn't pay that careful of attention to the clock, so I'm saying that, and maybe it's not the case, but anyhow, it's good being with you. Glad to study Second Corinthians. I think it's a cool book. I like it a lot, and I hope you do too. You're almost home on this year. Good job. Keep it up. Bible study, regular choosing to be together, to pray with one another and for one another, to spend time in simple fellowship and to gather around God's word. That's a really, really good thing. So I'm glad you did that. God's peace to you. See you next time.